Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. I'm coming to you from Jacksonville, Florida today, and a little over two years. My first trip through Jacksonville, I got to meet up with Gene Odom, who was the head of security for Leonard Skinner, one of Ronnie Van Zant's best friends, and was on that plane when it crashed that took so many of the lives of the band. Today we're gonna to meet up with Gene again because the last surviving original member, Gary Rossington, has passed away as well. So he is now buried with the rest of his bandmates out at Riverside Cemetery. So Days with Jordan the Lion, you all and the great Gene Odom, it begins right now. Well, here's the great Gene Odom, the man who survived the plane crash. The guy who everybody I've talked to, anything Leonard Skinner, they say Gene's the only guy you can believe. He's the only guy whose story doesn't change. He's the only guy who wasn't doing drugs, so he's got a clear head. And you agreed to come out and meet up with me again today because we met up about two years ago. And since we met up, we lost the last member, original member of the band, yeah. Gary Rossington. So I was hoping maybe you could show us where Gary's buried today and we could visit the other members and kind of talk about maybe the early days or the days of Skinnerd when you were involved and what you think about with each guy when you kind of think of them. Sure, yeah. But going back to what you said earlier, this is what's left of Gene Odom. Ain't that much left. Yeah, you um you were in just to give people a little backstory, you were one of Ronnie's best friends since you guys were kids. Yeah. And then when the band really kind of got going crazy, they brought you in to wrangle them a little bit. They knew you could enforce a little bit of law and order there if need be. Well, yeah, never drank, done no drugs, nothing. And Ronnie, they had got to the point they were, I don't know the right word, reaching the pinnacle. Yeah. They were getting that album, put them over the top, and they were headed to superstar them. And, uh, to let you know, in 1977, when the plane crashed, in the circle, they were known as the American Beatles. Really? I'd never heard that, but I can totally see that. Yeah. Here's one for you, too. In 1977, the Rolling Stones held Madison Square Garden record for five consecutive nights the Stones had sold out Madison Square Garden. The fall tour, if we'd have been able to make it, the Leonard Skinner Band had Madison Square Garden sold out for seven consecutive. No kidding, would have been a new record. A new record. Yeah. Now, for people that don't know your story, how early on in Skinner, from like the first practice, were you around? All the way back to we were kids, toddlers growing up. Me and Ronnie's the ones that captured Alan Collins because the day before, Ronnie wanted to talk to Gear, uh, Alan about playing with the band. And Ronnie passed him, and Alan towed his bike down and ran and climbed a tree. And so the next day, coming home from work, I went by. They were with a ball field, a, a, a vacant lot right across from J.R. Rice's house. J.R. was in the band of mods. And uh, uh, so um, I saw when they were playing ball, and Alan was pitching. And so I zipped on over to Ronnie's house. I said, hey, come on, man. Alan Collins, they're playing ball right across from JR's house. Alan's pitching, come on. We jumped into his Mustang and we run up there and grabbed Alan Collins off the mound and I hollered, we're going to come back and get his guitar and amplifier. And so Ronnie took Alan and spoke with Alan and Alan became part of the band. Now in high school, Ronnie was a really good football player and got injured when that happened. Is that when he kind of decided I'm all in music or? Well, let's go to the, go to the beginning. Um, he, um, Cassius Clay, which turned out to be Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Ronnie loved him fighting. And so Ronnie wanted to be a boxer, you know, and uh, a guy in the neighborhood was two or three, four years old enough named Estes Godwin is about that tall, a really stout guy. So he put the gloves on, but Ronnie, Ronnie, come on, and Estes beat the hell out of him. <laughs> that eliminated him wanting to be a boxer. Yeah. So, um, in school, he made, in Lee High School, he was only there for like a year or so, before he got out. And he uh, wanted to be a running back like Jim Brown. And so he made the team, and from the very first scrimmage, practice game from scrimmage, he got the ball. 
and got tackled and it broke his ankle all the hell. They had to put some couple of pins in him. So right there, that made him 4F, he couldn't be drafted. So then in three, two of his friends he went to high school with, which are his also best friends, Bill Fairs and Jim Daniels. They went, the Stones came to Jacksonville and played the stadium in 1964, I think. And they went to see the Stones. I went fishing, I think. And so, uh, <laughs> and when they came back. That would have been the first tour of the Stones, too, actually. Yeah, and when they came back, you know, Mick Jagger was dancing on the stage, and Ronnie came back, and he goes, man, I want to be a singer. And so, that was his fate. You know, he became a singer, songwriter. Bob Burns was on. The original drummer. The original drummer was on third base. Ronnie didn't know Bob Burns was rehearsing in the band. He had heard that Bob played drums. So Ronnie was at bat and Ronnie hit a ball. It actually hit Bob right above the shoulder blade, not in the back of the head. Knocked the piss out of him. Ronnie runs over there and you know, a couple of them run over there. Finds out they clue in Bob. So oh yeah, Bob Burns. Are you play drums? He says, yeah. We rap we practice right down by our house in my garage in my carpool. It was Gary Rossington, Bob Burns, Larry Johnston. Oh right, right. We rehearsed in Bob's carport. Back then it had concrete blocks on it with, with two doors. And that's rehearsal. Ronnie heard about it, so Ronnie went down there to listen to Bob Burns, Larry Judstrom, and Gary Rossington. So Ronnie like that, so Ronnie took over. Just you know, Ronnie became Okay, the, okay, now I get it. Now I get it. It became his band. <laughs> all of those years, it took me a while to finally put the whole package together. And things that he had say about Gary and different things, you know. Finally, it the package come together. Gary Rossington did not like the fact that Ronnie took over the band. Ronnie came in and took over and became the leader, the uh, uh muscle man to make that band turn yeah and they, gary resented that well he was a leader ronnie always sounds like from everything you've told me just a born leader yeah and two nights before we died we had a meeting here me and him in lakeland and uh, nobody knew what my job was with me and ronnie nobody at that time knew what i was doing and we were going to take over management and ronnie's other buddy a uh, best friend, Bill Fares, was going to become the manager because Bill was college educated. You found out they were getting ripped off, is what you told me. T shirts and all that stuff. Two nights before he died, I showed him on paper how it was happening, what was going on. Okay, that's it. He said, when we come back, we're taking a get the, you got a lot. I had, a, I had a, a legal team already set up. To Two days after we got back, Everything was going to be started by the legal team. He said, everything's got to be done legally. You can't, you can't fire anybody. You can't, because it's going to be lawsuits. And I'll tell you this. The whole management team was gone. Every, they were thieving some of bitches. They're, they were gone. And Ronnie, at the time, only three knew it. Me, Ronnie, and Steve Gaines. Was talking about bringing Bob Gaines, Steve's brother, the drummer, in for the new album. To replace Artemis. To replace Artemis. Artemis was gone. That was a done deal. The only thing that changed that was the airplane crash. That changed everything. And uh, all these years, you know, it's, I think about that constantly, but that was the truth. And Bill Ferris is a really top-notch guy. Him and Ronnie uh, and Widow are still friends, and Bill, I'm still friends with Bill. And Bill would have been the manager, and I'd have put a stop to the Leonard Skinner bed getting ripped off. So right over here, Gene is standing next to Gary's very recent burial place. And actually behind Gene is also Billy Powell, who was in the band. So Gene, what's the song that Gary's known for? Well, a bunch of them actually, but Simple Man. Gary wrote Simple Man. But I didn't know well, Gary what's the one that, the car crash? That's the one I was thinking of. Oh, 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 Troy, you're in my way. Yeah, but. Simple Man is such a, uh, I don't know the right words, I'm not smart enough or educated to know the big words, but Simple Man is just an iconic song. Yeah, and it's a perfect song, I feel like. Yeah. Simple and perfect. Yeah. And to become, to let you know that, the, the other two songs, Billy, Billy wrote Whiskey Rock and Roller. Leon Wilkerson wrote Traveling Man. That's the only two songs they ever wrote. And the songwriter was Ronnie. You know, Alan Geary and Steve Gaines, you know. That's right. Yeah. 
Now, how old was Gary when they joined, when he when they started the band? Because wasn't he like kind of the baby of the band? Uh, they were Alan, Gary, Larry, Bob, Bob uh, average about two years uh, younger than me and Ronnie. Okay. Uh, I, I, not, just say Ronnie. Uh, so if Ronnie was 20, they were 18, around there. And so the plane was, Ronnie died at 29, and Alan and Gary were like 27, 26, 27, at the time of the crash. But they, was it, was it, the rest of them were in the same age group, you know, because they went to school about the same time. What made them have three guitar players? That You didn't ever see that, and a lot of times you don't see it now. Yeah, Ronnie just liked the sound of that, and then, with Gary's style of playing. Um, I mean, Ed King came later, obviously, but I mean, I just thought, you know, with Alan and Gary, you would think you have enough almost, so. Ronnie wanted a little something a little different. He, you know, he just, in his mind, which nobody could get in there with him, he wanted his style, he just wanted that sound to come together. And the only time it ever changed was when Steve Gates came. Ed King left, that left a void of Ed King's talent, which was phenomenal. Yes. Ed King was, I would, I'm gonna say this on camera, without Ed King, they may have never made it to the Rock and Roll of Fame. Not because of Ronnie, because of Sweet Home Alabama. And Ronnie's uh, rough and rowdy drinking ways. Okay. Ed never liked Ronnie's rough and rowdy drinking ways, and that's the reason Larry Johnston left the band. About 19, I was overseas in the Army when he left. But Larry was educated, he was electric, electrical genius, and he didn't like Ronnie's rough and rowdy ways. And so- They were partiers, basically, Ronnie it, and the other guys, it, right? It, it, not Larry, yeah, and he didn't like that. So when 38 Special, was John, Donnie and Don Barnes and Jeff Carlisi putting 38 Special together, they didn't have a bass player. So Larry seen a chance to go to those guys and get away from the rough and rowdy ways of Ronnie, you know? Okay. Uh, the, the difference, shows yeah from what did ronnie i mean you you mentioned you figured out later that gary kind of resented maybe ronnie taking over the band did they get along as a band or did they butt heads quite a bit i'm gonna say this live on camera when we were putting this together about changing taking the management over at lakeland florida two nights before he died we were talking and he wasn't convinced. He said, Gene, he said, man, you don't know anything about management. You're, you just don't, you're not smart enough. To, I said, well, Bill Fares, I ain't got to worry about management. Bill Fares can take that. We'll just get a check that thing done. And he said, all right, no problem. But he said, I'm just not sure that you know what you're talking about. So I showed him on paper, basically, that this merchandising business. Number one, I said, you don't even own your own merchandising business. Your manager and secretary owns your merchandising business. I showed Ronnie on paper where all the money was going. And then he was sober. I, Did anybody else in the band know no, that there was a, anything being ripped off? No. And this is when I tied him, when I tied him to this. And so I said, okay, man, can I tell the band members what I'm really doing? This is a quote. Ronnie Van Zandt said, no. Nobody knows what we're doing but me and you. My wife don't even know what we're doing. I said, really? He said, nobody knows. I said, well, how about the press? Gary had the title of president because Ronnie didn't want no titles. I said, can I tell the press what we're doing? He said, hell no. He will cut my throat and stab me in the back the first chance he gets. I said, Gary? He really? Said, he said, yeah, I'm telling you, buddy. Quote, the first chance he got was a tribute to her, and I put a stop to it. Boy, did that cost me. Yeah, you you said that um, it seemed like like you didn't think that the band should go on and that Ronnie would want that and they were just trying to make money, basically, is what how you felt? This is a quote from him sent to me. You will never travel with my band again and make a dime. Quote, I sent back to him, you'll never rob a dead man and his kids either. Band has, is still going now with no original members, so... Let me tell you about that on this camera. 1987, they had, it was, it was March the 13th, 1978, Judy called a blood oath agreement meeting 
and I was with Helen Collins up to take him. And uh, the meeting, the band was over. Nobody could sing the songs. It was over. That was agreed upon. And everybody shook hands. We'll never use the name again. We'll never capitalize on the name Leonard Skinner again. And they all shook hands. I'm standing behind Alan Collins. He reaches up and grabs me by the hand. He says, you one of us, Gene. You one of us. Shake hands with everybody. I shook hands with everybody. I wasn't a band member or a shop holder or nothing. He said, you one of us. I did that. So for 10 years, they didn't do nothing. All of them were... Honored the word, yeah. Honored the word. All of them broke. Billy and Leon were homeless. Homeless. They're the two that came up in my driveway to ask me to help them put a reunion together. 1987. Wow. I can't do nothing. Hey, Gary was playing with the Rossington band in Atlanta. I said, go talk to Gary. He's playing in Atlanta, I heard, with the Rossington band. They ran up there, came back to my house the next day. What'd he say? Man, man he, Gary, Billy was about half shit face. He went, Gary said, I said, I'd never play that shit music again. Get out of here. He ran us off. I said, well, I can't help you. So anyway, but that stirred up the people that was behind Gary. Oh, you know, kind of people I'm talking about. right. And you can do something. Quick. People that can make some money off it. Yeah, management. It makes a big money. So, Gary calls Judy, and says, "I want to do." That's Ronnie's widow. Yep, right, widow. I want to do a tribute tour. First, they wanted to call it a reunion tour. I only want to do ten shows to make people quick money. Because Leon and Billy need had nothing to do with it being like an anniversary yeah. of the passing of Ronnie and yeah. the other band members or it was anything. Just for them to make some quick money because Billy and Leon were homeless, they needed money, and Billy needed to pay out the IRS, and Leon, I will get into that. Yeah. And so um, Gary agreed to do ten shows. So Alan, Judy, and Gary licensed the name Leonard Skinner Inc. Tribute Band. Tribute Tour, Tribute Corporation. They licensed it for 10 shows only. So that was the deal. They needed a singer. And I'm not going to mention the first guy that they talked about, or the second guy. I'm not going to put their names out. So they agreed that we're going to talk to Johnny. Because Johnny. Ronnie was his brother, so. His brother, and so they were talking to Johnny. So I just left Johnny walking from his mobile home to his daddy's house. I had just left him, so I knew where Johnny was at. I ran back to his house, caught him coming back from his daddy's to his mobile home. All this is a quote. I said, hey man, he said, look here. What's up, I said, they're having a meeting right now, they're gonna be calling you. I don't wanna tell them, don't call me, Gene. I don't wanna hear from him. I'm not gonna sing my brother's songs, never. I'll never do it. I said, listen, he said, now listen, you listen. I'm not going to do it. I would never sing my brother's songs. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. End of story. And he turned, he turned and walked away, so I grabbed him by the sleeve. And he, he was six or seven on his porch as he's moving home. He spun around. I wish he would have swung at me now, but he didn't. He said, man, look here. I can't sing my brother's songs. I would never do it. And you, who of you, of all the people that asked me, I said, listen. I pointed to his mom and daddy's house. I said, do it for your mom and daddy. Do it for the money. You're going to make a lot of money. Give them half of the money to make you feel better. Poof, you could hear a light bulb. He said, man, you know what? You got a point there, buddy. I could help, sure help one day. I said, you sure can. He shook my hand. He said, all right. I said, done deal. But when this t 10 shows is over, I'm putting my Johnny Van Zandt band back together. He shook my hand. And he went up on his porch and I left. I went back to the meeting and told him that, you know, that, um, Johnny would be. Yeah, he'd help out. And so they called Johnny. So Johnny became the singer. And so those t 10 shows were so successful, just like that, boom, booked, sold out, stadiums, coliseums, big shows. So Gary said behind Judy's back, hey, we're just going to keep playing. We're going to keep going. We're going to do shows, albums, and I'm taking your stock. So we got for the tribute tour out in Tennessee. They were rehearsing for a week before they played the first show at Charlie Daniels Volunteer Jam. I'm out there in a motel just doing this. A couple of days later, I get the itinerary. I'm looking at the itinerary. 30 shows booked and sold out, big shows booked and sold out. 
the next page of the thing it says stay tuned 60 more shows coming i called judy i said judy this ain't no 10 shows oh yeah gene that's all they can do tribute tours licensed for 10 shows only tribute inc i said judy did you get out of itinerary she said no so i called off those dates to her and i said stay tuned 60 more shows coming she said overnight that to me so overnight she got, she got it the next day she called me back what room is Gary in? I said, he's in room number 10. Quote, go to his room, tell him I'm calling him, and you stay and listen to the conversation. Please, that's all right. Wish I had never done that, but I didn't know. What's up, Gene? I said, man, Judy's gonna make the phone ringing. Come on in. I sit down. He's sitting on that side of his table, had a suite. He picked the phone up. So Judy's on the other end of the phone. What are you doing? You only can do 10 shows, the tribute tour. It's only 10 shows. We've licensed the name for 10 shows. Quote. I don't care about that. I'm done with that. I'm going to keep playing, making music, making albums, and I'm taking you to stop. You're out of the bed right now. You're no longer a member of Leonard Skinner Dink and hung the phone up. Wow. I'm thinking, do I stand up and kick his brains out? And then the phone rang right back. He picked the phone back up. It was Chuggy. What are you doing? You can't do this tribute tour of 10 shows. Quote, I don't give a damn about that. I'm booking more shows. I'm going to do more records. I'm taking your stock. You're out of the band. So she said something about Ronnie and the kids. He said, beep, Ronnie Van Zandt and you and your kids. Wow. You're out of the band, slammed the phone down and snatched the cord out of the ball. I stood up then. Quote, I said, boy, you think you're going to take that man's stock like that and kick him to the curb? Said, oh, yeah. I'm doing it. And ain't nothing you can do about it. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing to me, Gene Odom. You're Ronnie Van Zandt's friend. And if you choose the wrong side, hit the road, Jack. I said, I wouldn't let Ronnie do this to you. He says, I said, you done made your stand. I said, that's right, son. Till I die. So you had no love loss with, with Gary Rossington. No, not, not from then on. Because I knew him not as good as I did after that. And so that was the end of that. He quote, you'll, you'll never travel with my band and make a dime. I sent word back to him. I said, you'll never you never rob a dead man and his kids either. Now that cost me friends and cost me millions of dollars of potential book and t-shirt sales from 1987 right. till today. You know, so I don't regret that. I would do it, I'd have done the same thing for him. But Ronnie Van Zandt told me, that man will cut my throat, stab me in the back the first chance he got. The very first chance he got, he tried to stab Ronnie in the back. So now behind Gene, Billy Powell, and Billy, you want to tell the story how Billy ended up being affiliated with the band or how he joined the band? Billy and Leon went to school together and grew up together, like me and Ronnie. Billy and, Billy and Leon were good buddies. And so uh, Billy was Leon's roadie to set up um, Leon's bass amp and stuff, you know, like that. And so they were trying to get Freebird all together. And uh, Leon told Billy one day, had a cassette. Uh, of Freebird. He says, take this home and you put some music on this and, and I'm gonna present it to Ronnie. Because he so, could play piano. So Billy put the music to Freebird and Leon took it to Ronnie, rehearsal. Listen to this. Ronnie went, what, who's that? He says, Billy. Ronnie went, what? You, you playing that? Yeah, he said, I, I put that music together. Ronnie said, well, you're in the band. That's awesome. Billy went from roadie to superstar, you know? Billy was one of the few survivors in the crash, along with yourself. Yeah. Says that he played it pretty. He played it pretty. He sure did. That's a beautiful headstone. His, and then his, 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 his widow and sons put that together. That's really nice. I love that they're all so close. Well, most of them are so close together yeah. mm -hmm. because Ronnie is actually right over here. January two years ago on his birthday. Like he, right after we met. She moved him. So he's not here anymore? He's here. Oh, he's here, but in a different spot. We're going over. And so Judy moved that. And so let me tell you the story. About okay, yeah, because I thought I had heard there was some change, but then I, I pulled in and saw the headstones over there. Let me tell you how Ronnie got put here. So Gene, the last time we were here, this is where Ronnie was, correct? Yeah, he was here. What happened or where, where exactly was he that, that the headstone was moved? Two. Well, I mean, when we were over here last time, where was he? Right here. He was right here where Tammy Michelle? Yeah. 
Tammy had put her headstone over there years ago. And I'm not gonna get into the, the fan then a story, but Tammy and them, they all got- Who's daughter. Tammy, if you don't mind telling people? Uh, Ronnie's daughter by his first wife, Nadine. Ronnie's daughter. There's a picture. In 1967. And so, uh, When, Ron, when Ronnie's mausoleum got broken into at Orange Park, yeah, they needed a place to put his casket, and so this was the Van Zant plot, struck it, and they really wanted Ronnie here to first, but Judy was in charge of Ronnie, and so she put him out there. But when his mausoleum got broken into, this was available, which is his parents right his here. Parents, yeah. This was the Van Zant plot, so she moved him here. And about January, it'll be two years that she moved him over there, I think a year or two years. And uh, it's um, I never said too much about it because none of my business, number one, but number two, the spot she moved into is so nice, beautiful. Good. I love some fish and the ducks and the birds and but a little, it's, it's really quite beautiful. Nice. And so uh, Tammy died. And so, uh, Judy lived in Barry Tammy here. Yeah, very recently. Right, my sister and Lacey. And those are Ronnie's parents, his father Lacey. And you notice the rings. Did you see that? Looks like the wedding and engagement rings or something like that. Yes, I'm gonna put a couple of rings up there. Yeah. I'm surprised somebody ain't, some of these people are still by here, especially that guy picks all the money up. Then not to be forgotten, right across from Ronnie, before we go back to see where he's at now, the old spot is bass player Leon Wilkerson. Fly on, proud bird. You're free at last. Yeah. Cool style. You said he only wrote one song for the band? Just one. Traveling Man. It's a great one. Of course, he put the bass parts and all that stuff, but he's credited for writing the song. And Billy's credited for writing uh, Whiskey Rock and Roll. Where's Ronnie at now? Uh, right around the curve over here where that uh, building is. So the left of that building. Okay, so let's go over there. Yeah. yeah, they moved him out here by the lake. All the way over there. Gene's out there feeding the ducks. Over here by himself. This is amazing. This is really beautiful. I thought I saw there was a statue somewhere, so I didn't know. I thought I had heard that they moved him and wasn't sure what exactly the situation was. Here he is. Great front man and singer of Leonard Skinner, Ronnie Van Zant. You know, originally, like Gene said, when they first uh, buried Ronnie, he was in a wall mausoleum. And I'll actually have Gene tell you his story about how he found out what happened to Ronnie. But uh, then they moved him on this, in the same cemetery to a mausoleum, and then someone broke into it. So that's why they eventually moved him over here to this cemetery. Now, Gene, I kind of hate to bring it up, but man, it's like one of those stories you told me that sticks in my head, and I, I just, I never could forget it. Do you mind telling people how you found out that you didn't know Ronnie had passed away? You were on the the flight, that infamous flight, and you can pick up the story wherever you'd like to because you're probably the last person that talked to Ronnie Van Zandt alive. And the pilot. Um, after the crash, I had a massive, massive head injury. And I guess... Mr. Zippy Jackson, I guess they thought I was brain dead because they did very little. And so um, my neck was broke, my rib roll broke, and um, I was melted and had big holes burned in me. From what come to find out was phosphorus from flares. They didn't know I was even under the plane under there for about an hour and a half, so they got everybody out. And they'd set Billy down on the wing and somebody else. And Billy said I kind of crawled out some of them under the wing. and. He's seen this big hole in my head and blood and everything, whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, hey, come help Gene, here's Gene. And so then they came and probably working on me. Um, but I've gone there for an hour and a half, probably completely unconscious. And 
thank God I called out because if they'd have left me there till in the morning when they finally come to. Yeah, when they got light and everything. That's where I've been dead, you know, I was brain dead anyway. And, and a big thank you to you for meeting me out there because you got all the first responders that were there to come out and meet us. So all of you told the story together and were able to dispel rumors that have been spread since by other survivors and things like that. So my ex-wife and my, my girlfriend at the time got me and they put me on another flight and flew me to Jacksonville so I could get some plastic surgery and stuff done. And so um, I was in the hospital a week there for three weeks here about, about about a month, I was in the hospital for about a month, and uh, nobody ever told me, nobody ever said anything about the people that were dead or injured. And I don't, I was under so much morphine, uh, not morphine, Demerol, that I don't remember if I asked too many questions. But as soon as I got out of the hospital, I told my girlfriend, I said, I want to go visit Ronnie, I want to go see Ronnie. So she starts driving, and you know, I'm in my mind, I'm going to see Ronnie. At his house, or yeah, yeah. you know, Al, Al, Al got was in that, and uh, she's going to where he lived in that direction, and she turns into the cemetery. And, and what are you doing in here? You know, she said, This is where Ronnie's at, he didn't make it. And boy, I tell you what, it broke my heart. I mean, they just, you know, I bet, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So, there's a second part to this same cemetery across the street, and that's where Alan Collins. And Leonard Skinner himself is buried, so we're going to go over and visit. Right directly across the street. I see a beer can over there. Yeah, they got beer cans and stuff here. They'll clean them up. Here's Alan. Yep. And Cassie. Larkin Allen Jr. Yep. Alan's the one, if you ever watched the live performances, he had the crazy wild hair flowing and soloing through Freebird. Just iconic look. Without him, you would never, ever achieve the Leonard Skinner scent. Never. I think you're right. The only album that come close to it was the Alan Collins band here, there, and back. I was in Larkin's office when MCA called. They said, this is the best album since Street Survivors but he was paralyzed in that car. Right? Yeah. And MCA says to Larkin, businessman, you know, we can't put any money behind anybody in a wheelchair. They say, well, that album would have been platinum in one week if he hadn't been got paralyzed. If it were nowadays, they would have put it out. Yeah. Well, they put it out and it was shipped, like a, they shipped 250,000 to the East Coast and it would have been platinum. But when he got paralyzed, that just cut the money off. Alan Collins, rest in peace. He's here with Kathy, his wife Kathy. He was a mess. So over there where those mausoleums are is where Leonard Skinner himself is buried. So Gene's gonna take us over there. There's the Last Supper over there. Help you find it. Right there. F. Leonard Skinner, who was Leonard Skinner to these guys, Gene. That was uh, the gym coach. Gary's and Ronnie's, while well, Ronnie was there. And Leonard was a, also a history teacher. But he was the gym coach and got on Gary's ass many times by his hair. Made Gary keep his hair trimmed, made him wear a hair, hair net one time. <laughs> Man, what a way to be memorialized. Exactly. So we've seen all the members that are over here, so we're going to go over to Orange Park and visit Stephen Cassie. When I got out of the hospital a month later, he was in a, a one of those temporary uh, units up there until this was put here. But this was his original spot, except for the temporary place up there. Then they moved him over there, and then Judy moved into the new spot. So now he's in his fourth spot. This is the one that got broken into, unfortunately. Why didn't they move this? Why did they leave his old well, crypt she, here? She wanted to move it, but the mausoleum people told her that, that those were put there to stay. Okay. And with all of that marbling in it, they was afraid it would break in trying to take it apart. Okay, that makes sense. And so she had them make 
a, a replica of the front of it. Uh, that's what's up his That's right. what we saw, yeah. And then over here is Steve. Uh, this is Steve Gaines. Steve is here. Cassie and his mother and dad are back there. Teresa Gaines is over there. So here's Steve. He was Ed King's replacement. Yep. And they have the same birthday. Oh, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> the eternal flame and then Cassie and the Gaines parents yeah. are and back here. Cassie's named after her mother. Both of them Cassie the Roof. And Earl Bud. Steve's wife. And then after the airplane crash, after Steve died, she married Barry Rep. Well, Gene, thanks for coming out and meeting up with me today. I know you, you told me, like, some of these stories are not what maybe the fans expect to hear, but they're the truth. I ain't nothing but the truth. So thank you for coming out, showing us around, telling us the stories. And if anybody would like to take your tour, I will put the link right here, and they can contact you there and go take a tour all over Jacksonville with you. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today. Thank you all for watching. If you want to see more, look on my channel under Leonard Skinner. We have done, Gene and I have done several vlogs together, including out at the crash site. We went to all the locations around here that he'll take you to. So it's a good time. I think you guys will learn a lot. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time from a rainy Jacksonville. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.